Hi, I'm Rhea. Hi, I'm Hayley, and together we are Chronicles of a Spoonie, sharing stories, creating connections. So today we have Maisie with us, and Maisie has this incredible list of conditions, and we are going to try and cover as much as we can because there's some rares in there for sure. Yeah, there are. And, you know, I, I just look forward to hearing the journey she's gone on because, you know, we've obviously looked through the conditions that she has and when she's had them from and a lot of hers are lifelong. So I'm really intrigued to see how they came about and sort of how they've affected her through every stage of, of her life so far. Absolutely. I'm just also looking forward to loving how to say them again because we seem to have that every week at the minute with me. Um, <laughs> but on that note, let's get her in. Yeah, let's speak to Mizzy. Maisie, would you like to say a little bit about yourself? Hi, I'm Maisie, as you've heard, and I am 19, and I'm currently a uni student studying English and creative writing, and I've got three dogs back home, and uh, what else? <laughs> I like reading a lot, which explains my, my uh, degree. <laughs> Is there any um, any books in particular? Uh oh, I like like crime thriller type things because you know like something that's going to keep me gripped. And then I do like classics, but I think it most of the time it comes with the territory mm. <laughs> with the degree. Is it just sort of something then that you've loved all your life with literature and English and stuff? Is that what made you want to do it? Yeah, I mean, my mum has always been a big reader. Um, so I kind of just got it from her and it just sprung from there and I've always loved English so I thought why not I was gonna do law but then I figured with my anxiety and stuff it wouldn't be great being in a courtroom so <laughs> I'd just be like yeah it wouldn't be great um, <laughs> um so just to quickly um ask this before we really get into it with your list of con conditions there's quite a few do you find uh, going to university, univer going to university is affected by them or does it just seem to run quite smoothly? I think definitely. There's no doubt in my mind that my conditions have affected my university experience mm -hmm. uh, as a whole, I think. Because obviously I've got to go through the whole business of sorting out support for myself, like getting extra time in exams and... I had to do all of that before I came here. So I had to get through loads of paperwork and different applications to the wellbeing services and things like that. So yeah, it's definitely impacted it. And then as well with the homesickness, that's definitely been amplified by like my, some of my conditions. Yeah. And you'll see why. <laughs> I didn't realise that prior to actually starting university, there was a whole like rigmarole of stuff that you had to do in order to get the support services actually set up and running I thought it would you would imagine should be fairly straightforward yeah there was a, it was quite a long process there were several phone calls but I mean the uni have been great um but it just took a lot more time than the average person to get the ball rolling because I had to you know call them up and ask them you know what support can I get as a person who's got extra needs mm -hmm what support can you provide me and they've been really good and I've got enough support and everything and it's been really good so yeah no complaints there but it's definitely been a lot of a it's been a bit of a slog to get everything done in time for me to come here in October yeah definitely something there with others that we've we've heard as well that university has been quite uh, accommodating to help those with extra needs to get what they need um, oh 100 percent which is really good to hear. It really is. And I'm really glad that they're supporting you and you're able to then get through um, your college and get, get to where you want to be, which is absolutely mm -hmm. fantastic. It really is. But going backwards a bit, did you have the same support with school? And... Yes, because um, I moved schools from um, year eight. I moved schools and stayed at that school until I was in sixth form. Um, but yeah the one beforehand was a bit more tricky mm -hmm. but then once I moved schools the support was really good um yeah 
it's good to hear it really is good to hear now to hear so many horror stories from everybody else it's wonderful to hear that that you got the support you, got that you needed mm. i feel very lucky because i know not many people have had the same support that i have and it's been really good and it sounds like your family are right up there behind you oh 100 <laughs> do you have siblings uh well i've got half siblings or no step siblings sorry um i've got an old quite like an older brother and older sister but yeah yeah they're really behind me all the way which is really lovely that's wonderful okay so going back to the beginning right to the beginning Mm -hmm. and before you were even um, in the world um did did your did your mum know prior to birth about that you were going to have any conditions yeah um I think I don't know what week it was in the pregnancy but they knew before I was born that there was something wrong something not as not average Mm -hmm. um yeah because before I was born they diagnosed me with like with Biedemann syndrome uh the BWS um and I think it was because um how do I put this without it sounding slightly disgusting um I had some of my uh, internal organs outside of my body. So, so they saw it on the ultrasound. And then I've also got something called macroglossia, which means I've got a larger tongue than normal. Okay. Um, so that's led to me having two tongue reductions. Uh, yeah, when I was wow. like one. Um, yeah. Bless you. And they saw, they saw the like larger tongue on the ultrasound, I think. And then obviously... The organ thing was kind of a bit obvious. Um, so, which organs? Did, did you know which organs it was? That oh God, it was like it was like my intestines and everything was outside of my body. Wow. Yeah. So, was that sort of straight after birth, straight in for surgery kind of thing? Yeah. Yeah. There was no, there was no question that I wasn't going to get that sorted. Yeah. As soon as I was born, they wheeled me off and I got that sorted. So you were a C-section then? No, natural. Oh wow. I don't know how my mum did it, but. Fair play to your mum. Yeah, fair play to my mum. I don't know how the hell she did it. Um, especially because with BWS, I was born at 30 weeks, but I was um like because BWS is classed as an overgrowth disorder, mm-hmm. I was full term weight, so I was eight pounds, but born at 30 weeks. Oh wow, okay. I don't know how she did it. <laughs> I really don't. I can. I mean, I had read, and it was actually one of my first questions. And I was talking to Haley about. I wanted to ask is that it says for symptoms is an above average weight, birth weight. And I was going to mm-hmm. ask what your birth weight was, but your birth weight was eight pounds at thirty weeks. I can only imagine that if you'd gone full term, it would have been ridiculous. <laughs> like, I'm sure your mum's glad it didn't go full term. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Wow. So was it just a case of it was whenever sort of back whenever you were still in the womb and they saw mm-hmm. that the organs were outside of your body, did they have to actually do investigations or is it really clear cut when they see that that they know straight away it's the BWS or um I'm not a hundred percent sure, but I think obviously it was 2002 so there's more knowledge now than there was then. But I think it was referred to a specialist, like a geneticist type thing. And then they discovered, you know, this is what it is, because it's one extra chromosome from my dad, which will explain why everyone says that we look creepily similar. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how they, yeah. But I think it, it went to geneticism, because I think when my mum was pregnant with me, my dad went to a geneticist, after they found out that that's what it was and they said you are going to look very very similar and then hey presto I pop out I look like my dad like my friends keep saying to me amazing you look exactly like your dad like it's creepy but um when I was born two days after my birth mum actually passed away so um that my mum she step parent adopted me when I was I can't remember how old I was but bless her she step parent adopted me so yeah so oh wow yeah yeah I did not know that yeah no my birth mum passed away yeah it was two days after I was born 
but yeah. Was that complications from the birth, was it? Yeah, it was postpartum cardiomyopathy. So yeah, essentially her heart just kind of gave up. I don't know how to describe it really, but yeah. yeah. Oh my God, um, that's so amazing. That's all right. Um, yeah, it's it's odd, definitely. Um, you know, obviously I didn't know my birth mum, but I cannot describe to you how grateful I am for my mum. Mm -hmm. Like, because I, you know, she step parent adopted me, and it's been just so lovely. Because you know, I've got that motherly figure. Yeah, it's just so lovely, and me and her, we get we're so close, we get on really well. And it's just really lovely because um, I think my dad met her when I was two. Um, so then they've been together ever since. And I think when I was, a, I can't remember how old I was. I'm not even going to try. Um, yeah, the rest was history. So your dad went through the original surgeries with you on his own? Mm hmm Wow. Wow. Yeah. Poor dad. Yeah. yeah. hard. Losing his partner and then yeah he went he went through the mill that's for sure and that's an understatement of the century mm -hmm. he went through so much yeah um I mean him and I are so close like I'm so close to both of my parents my dad and I I'm such a dad's girl <laughs> it's ridiculous <laughs> like honest to God yeah. oh I love that though I love that you and him have such a close bond, you know, especially, I know obviously you were incredibly young, but after everything that you and him did actually go through, yeah, that you do, you have such a closeness and, yeah. you know, that's, that's everything. I remember when um, I left for uni, um, obviously both of us, were, all three of us were devastated, but I remember my dad saying that he felt like he'd lost a limb <laughs> when, when I left and I was just like, oh, don't. <laughs> I feel like I've lost two. I've got one. I've got, you know, my mum and dad leaving me. That was awful. But, you know, we get, it gets better. But, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't fun the first time, that's for sure. Um, but, yeah, oh, my mum, it's, it's actually quite funny because my mum keeps saying to me that people think that she was my birth mum because we do actually look quite alike. Yeah. Um, which I find really lovely. It's yeah just, it's really nice I, th I think because you take on their characteristics don't you a uh, characteristic yeah. sorry and I think when you when you move and do what they do it, it just I think it gives a, a look alike yeah I mean my mum and I are really different people but we get on really well so it's really lovely because you just kind of got my dad and I are kind of more quiet and you know yeah. we're not as feisty as my mum but my mum's properly feisty and it's so <laughs> it's so nice actually to have that different mm -hmm. a bit of balance <laughs> yeah exactly it provides a bit of a equilibrium in the house yeah. <laughs> I love that oh that's I'm so glad you've had such a supportive unit there though through all of that and you've had that mother figure there from yeah. such a young age as well because yeah. it impacts too doesn't it and yeah it does you know, you've had a great family unit around you my aunt has been amazing as well. I just wanted to put that on. Like she was, she, she's been there for me since the start. That's for sure. That's my dad's sister. Um, yeah, she was amazing from the start. So I've kind of had that motherly figure from the start as well as my aunt and my dad. And it's just been so lovely because I've always had that kind of family net. Mm -hmm. kind of network around me um like a support network it's just been amazing love it it's so important it really is when you go through so much which we've got a lot of pages here so you definitely do so it's wonderful to hear that your network is per is is just so wonderful it really is yeah. um but going back to you obviously your dad went through the first surgeries on his own mm -hmm. um do you know what the first surgeries were like do they do your tongue then or no, they did, um, obviously, as soon as I was born, they did the stomach thing. And then um, they had to man make me a new belly button. So that's something unique um, about me. That's um, right now. Hmm. Yeah, not many people can say that they've got a, 
An artificial belly button. <laughs> An artificial belly button. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, so that's that's fun. Um, yeah, because obviously I was born so early, so I was put in an incubator. And then I can't remember how long it was after I was born. But obviously I was in hospital for a long time. But then I think, God, I don't know how old I was, but not long after I was born, I had a brain hemorrhage. Yeah. Wow. Um, I didn't have much luck. <laughs> at the start no um and when I had that brain hemorrhage that then led to me developing the hydrocephalus yeah it kind of it weaves in as as a point to the diversions um but yeah so then I developed hydrocephalus from that recovered from the brain hemorrhage but then obviously the hydrocephalus meant that I had to have a shunt fitted Mm -hmm. do I yes I do yeah I'm gonna go into that story because the um One of the times that my shunt failed, I was on holiday in Portugal and my shunt failed while I was on holiday with my parents. So how did you know that it had failed? What, what, and then did you get symptoms or? Yeah, um, headache, nausea, sickness, awful lethargy, awful tiredness to the point where, you know, I'm completely out of it. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so my parents just knew that I was not feeling well. but then I started to feel, I think I started to be a bit better, but then I went down again. And then I ended up having to go, I spent a night in a Portuguese hospital and then have it, had to fly back to get the shunt replaced. Yes. Safe to say we've never been, well, we haven't been on many holidays abroad since. And what age were you whenever that happened? Um, six. Wow. I think I was about six, yeah. Yeah, I think... I think that scared us from going on holiday abroad. So I think the next time we went on holiday abroad was to America in 2017. So, I mean, we went to like Devon and Cornwall and stuff, but I think my parents were just too scared by my shunt failing. And then when I'd gone like a few good years without it failing, they were just like, right, okay, we're good now. I think think we can risk going to America. (laughs) Do you still have that shunt in? Uh, Yeah, the shunt that they replaced. I still have in now so yeah that fingers crossed touch word it doesn't fail again um, yeah I've had it over more than a decade now so it's going strong. So is there sort of a, a time frame on how long a shunt is in before it gets replaced you know do they know how long it should last? Um, I mean there's no specific time limit um, it just lasts as long as it lasts okay. I mean some people can have one shunt and have it last for the whole life. Okay Whereas some people like myself need to have it taken out and replaced a couple of times before it lasts for a long time. But I mean, I've had no issues with it so far with this new one. Well, new, decade old one. Um, and the hydrocephalus that it's for, what actually is that? Um, it's a buildup of fluid on the brain. And what's it caused by? Um, I'm not 100% sure, but I mean, obviously mine was caused by the hemorrhage, um, which is kind of was the catalyst for it. Mm-hmm. and then I got that shunt fitted I think it failed a couple of times um I think the first one failed quite quickly mm-hmm. and then the second one failed about a year or two later and then I don't know what shunt I'm on now three or four I don't know mm-hmm. I'm inclined to say three but I don't want to get it wrong but I think it's like the third or fourth okay so I know you mentioned that it was the brain hemorrhage that sort of was the catalyst for that. Was there something that triggered the brain hemorrhage or is that just a completely random event or? You know, I don't know, but I'm guessing the fact that I was born early can't have helped. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because despite the fact, you know, I've got that overgrowth disorder, I was probably still not completely developed elsewhere. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So um, that I don't know. I don't know. Um, I don't think I've ever asked my my parents that to be honest um but yeah I my guess is that it was just because I was born early and yeah. hadn't been developed fully elsewhere and probably a lot of trauma to the body with everything else going on and all the surgeries exactly. and you know it's probably exactly. just a, a lot for a tiny little body to cope with mm-hmm. exactly yeah I think in terms of like the surgeries that happened when I was born just to flip back to it um I think it was the I got the stomach thing fixed Mm -hmm. and then um, I can't remember how long it took 
before that brain hemorrhage happened. And I mean, I had that like one surgery when I was first born. And then obviously, I don't know what they did about the brain hemorrhage. I'm assuming they went in and fixed it. Mm -hmm. You have a lot to remember, so. (laughs) There's a lot. (laughs) And you were so young, you wouldn't have had memory. So it's kind of going off like third party. (laughs) Yeah, it's me trying to memorise my hospital records. (laughs) Do you know, there's um, a question actually I didn't know you were a preemie um, that I would love to ask you um, I don't know if you know that there's a woman called Colleen Ballinger um, mm-hmm. she's just had uh, twin preemies and yeah. um, I'm not a follower I'm not like I don't, don't do anything like that but a video came off my channel the other day and she was speaking about having preemie babies and the fact that even though that you're born early you still have got to catch up the three months so you're you're three months always three months behind on Mm. on learning and the question I I wondered and I get to ask you now obviously is do you notice that have you ever noticed being at that little bit behind I mean in certain aspects yes Mm -hmm. I mean when I say certain aspects I mean maths um I think we all feel out about maths don't we (laughs) <laughs> that's just a no that, that that did not that was not a good time um maths was my absolute nightmare um from GCSE yeah from primary school to GCSE it was awful so I did have to access support for that I failed it the first time mm-hmm. and then passed it by the skin of my teeth the second time I would still be doing maths GCSE now if I hadn't have passed. <laughs> oh my god! Oh, brilliant! <laughs> I love that. So, to clarify, you were born with Beckwith syndrome. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, what I've read and what Hayes read um, is that it's um, a specific region of a chromosome. If we have the chromosome name of one one p one five point five here. Don't know if you know know that one. Chromosome eleven. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It says eleven, and then in brackets has eleven eleven p fifteen point five um in it, which is the name for Beckwith syndrome in chromosome. Yeah. Um, yeah. What specifically is Beckwith syndrome? Uh, Beckwith Wiedemann is an overgrowth syndrome, um, which also when you're younger puts you at risk of developing Wilms tumours that's to the normal eye or ear. It's a kidney cancer. And then, um, okay. yeah, and it also, for me, it's come out as, I've got quite a severe case of it. Um, I've got one leg longer than the other, okay. significantly, which has led to me having two two leg lengthenings ow um, yeah yeah ow indeed so I had like um I'm gonna try I'm trying to describe things to make them sound less gross but it is what it is it was an external fixator that went into my bone and lengthened my leg ow. right okay so this is maybe a really silly question mm-hmm. but is there a decision made on whether to lengthen or shorten because obviously one's what, what makes them decide to in, in increase the length rather than decrease see I think my mum asked the question of whether they could have just not shortened the long leg yeah but I think they said that they couldn't do it for some reason I think because it causes issues with the bones right um or something I don't know I'm not I'm not a doctor so I can't really tell you what it is but um I think they said that they couldn't shorten the leg so they just have to lengthen the other one um because I think probably it makes sense though because with the lengthening essentially what you're doing is breaking the bone stretching it out so that it creates new bone in between whereas when you're trying to shorten it it just doesn't add up in my head how they can do that but yeah I think it was always going to be a lengthening thing and I had a few operations on my knees because there was one point because I am quite tall I'm six foot so it's yeah Um, I get it from my dad he's six foot five Um, (laughs) God. wow um yeah so he used to be six foot six actually oh he's, he's shrinking though. <laughs> it's quite funny he's gonna hate me for 
say how he shrunk, <laughs> but he did. Um, he hadn't shrunk an inch though, so it's not that bad. Um, <laughs> I think he put his back out or something happened with the discs mm. and it shrunk in white an or something. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Um, oh, bless your dad. <laughs> yeah. Um, I can't remember what I was saying now. <laughs> your dad's going to love you. <laughs> The knees, knees are dressed. The knees, there we go. <laughs> Back on track. Um, <laughs> they did try to destroy the growth plates in my knees or like in that left knee. So I had like eight plates put in, which like metal, I don't understand it, but it was some kind of metal plate that they put in my knee. That didn't work and it left me knock knees. So they had to, uh, so they had, or partially. So they ended up having to take them out and then. So they ended up having to do another um, lengthening. The problem that I had was the silly eight-year-old me decided to walk without her walking frame while I had my first frame on and I broke my femur. Oh, your femur? Yes. The most painful break. I don't know if I've ever been in so much pain in my life. It was mm. horrendous. It was a green stick fracture as well, so... Um, I mean, you can do your own research on that if you don't know what it is, but it's kind of grim. It's where the bones kind of, whenever you, wherever I move, the bones were grinding against each other. Yeah, it was, it was grimy. Um, it was hideous. And especially because I had the uh, frame on my leg at the time, because I think what had happened is I landed on my knees and the frame went into the back of my leg. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to kind of, slow it down because I can see you too cringing no it's just the thought of you being eight years old and going yeah. through that it's, it, yeah. it's not for me it's not the description it's no. picturing this young child having mm. to go go and go through that you know that's the bit that's yeah it was hideous it was awful <laughs> I've never been in so much pain in my life imagine and like the doctors didn't know what to do because I had this frame on my leg and I didn't get it put on at my local hospital it was put on at Great Ormond Street so they didn't know what to do with me because obviously I had this frame on my leg, on my shin, mm -hmm. and I broke my femur. So they were on the phone to Great Ormond Street back and forth for two or three days trying to figure out what to do with me. They didn't know whether to send me to Great Ormond Street or to keep me there. I went in on like the Sunday night mm -hmm. and then um, they operated and put a plate on my femur on the Thursday. Wow. Yeah. That's a lot. It sounds like you've got more metal in your legs than you do bones at this point. Well, funnily enough, that got taken out when they did the uh, when they did the femur lengthening. Um, so that was like two operations back to back. Wow. That is a lot. So yeah, that, that was a fun time. Um how many surgeries have you had in total? Oh god. Uh I think I'm in the 30s now. And you're 19. Yeah. Um, I mean, my mum and my mum and I tried to count them and we lost count. So I think that says all you need to know. Oh my goodness. Um, that's a that's a lot to go through, maybe. Mate, that's how that's what nearly two a year? Yeah. For every year of your life. Yeah. I mean, one <laughs> of the things I was reading um in, in the wonderful research we had in front of us, um that it, it says that a lot of things that you go through with your um, Beckwith is treated by a multiple consultants. Do you have a lot of consultants or do you just have one that just kind of does everything? Um, when I was younger, in paediatrics, I had a lot. I had urology, nephrology, so that's mm -hmm. like for my kidney issues, and then, um, which mm -hmm. I will move on to in a minute. And uh, then I have, at the moment, I've only got, well, I was seen by a specialist orthopedic surgeon when I moved into adults, but then um, he's kind of said, you know, if you don't want to do anything else, you don't have to. So we're leaving that as it is for now, and unless anything goes wrong, um, please don't. Such words. So at the moment I'm under, how many people am I under at the moment? Not as many as I used to be, because I was discharged from a lot of my paediatric, well, obviously, but a lot of my paediatric stuff mm -hmm. didn't get carried over. Mm -hmm. 
So orthopedics are not currently under anyone specifically at the moment. Um, urology, I'm under someone. At the moment, I'm literally just under urology and gynecology at the moment because I've got ovarian cysts, which do kind of relate to stuff, which I will go into. Um, so yeah, I'm under them for that. Mm -hmm. and I, I think, I think, oh yeah. And then my neurosurgeon carried over to adults, okay. which is good. So I've yeah. got the same person. I think that means a lot, especially with something like neurology, you kind of want that, that trust and consistency between. Yeah, because obviously that's really scary. You know, yeah. someone doing something in your brain, it's kind yeah. of a bit. You want oh. trust. Yeah. And, you know, I've got trust with that surgeon. Bearing in mind, I haven't seen my surgeon in like over a decade now because I haven't needed right. to. <laughs> So with the, sorry, I'm, I'm a bit quick, I say I'm not, not heard of it. And obviously if we have someone that has it, I just want to make sure that right. everything's covered. And between me and Hayley, we'd like to ask a lot of questions. So um, we should know everything and more by the end of this. Um, but some of the symptoms <laughs> say uh, that you can suffer with um, enlarged internal organs. Is, is that the case for you? Yeah. I mean, I don't know whether the kind of, the intestines coming out of my body might serve to say that but I don't think I've got specifically enlarged internal organs as far as I know but you did have the enlarged tongue yeah so that probably comes under it yeah so yeah yeah I've got the enlarged tongue and you had two you've had two surgeries yeah two, two tongue, tongue reductions because um I mean they did refer I think they said that I might have issues with my speech when I was older Mm -hmm. but I'm fine with my speech yeah. um surprisingly actually because I think for me um my tongue is one of my biggest insecurities really? because it doesn't it doesn't look like a normal tongue at all right. it's really strange it's it's horrid I don't like it um because I think the problem is is that obviously it might have looked better had I have been born about 19 years later because obviously in 2002, I've got to bear in mind that that's nearly 20 mm -hmm. years ago, that they probably didn't know as much about it. Yeah. And there's probably no ways that they could have hidden how slightly odd it looks. But it's like with my, like my best friend and my family, like, you know, you're just like sticking your tongue out at someone. Yeah. I'll only do it to them because I don't yeah. like it because it really makes me self-conscious. I mean, it's not fun but at the same time it's my tongue no one's yeah. gonna see it so yeah it's just kind of my thing that I keep to myself um I don't actually talk about it as much I mean I do talk to my parents about it a lot and they know it like they know how insecure I am about it mm. but um I mean it is what makes me me so I can't complain you're, too you're, much. Unique, you're unique <laughs> for a reason you know and you've mm -hmm. gone through a heck of a lot. So if that is your your one thing, then you know, yeah, we, we will not continue to talk about that. We will we will move we will move off onto something else. I actually have one more question about the um, BWS. I know you mentioned, um, you know, you think from two thousand two to now, you know, got to twenty years, there's been a huge improvement. Do you know what the diagnosis rate is do you know how many people actually have it or if it's increased in how many people have it over the past 20 years um I think it's definitely increased I think I looked a few years back and it was one in 15,000 and then I looked I think when I was do, when I was doing research to try and find a link to a website mm -hmm. for the podcast I was um looking and I think it's gone up as in it's one in 10,000 now okay. but I think there's more people being diagnosed with it now but I think because it was 20 years ago no one yeah. knew about it yeah. so less people were getting diagnosed and I think it's quite a hard illness to diagnose with because there's so many it's a spectrum because some people can just have like one or two symptoms and get mm -hmm. completely dismissed um, whereas others like myself We've got pretty much every single symptom in the, symptom under it, um, bar a few. You're literally the medical journal of. We are. <laughs> the amount of doctors I've had that have tell, 
and told me, oh, we've had a meeting and it involved you. And I'm like, oh, how fun, how fun. I'm a celebrity yeah. in the doctor world. Yeah. Um, so you had mentioned earlier that you previously had nephrologists that you were under whenever you were a child. And I think that was to do with your kidneys. I, think, I know you mentioned that you do have a kidney disease. So could you tell us a bit about it? Yeah. So um, essentially, when I was two, I know I mentioned earlier that, you know, BWS does put you at higher risk of getting Wilm tumours when you're little. And I was um, diagnosed not with Wilm's tumours, but I did have a form of kidney cancer when I was two, like one and a half, two. I think it was neuroblastoma. Um, And that led to one and a half of my kidneys being removed. Uh, Yeah, that's my little party trick. (laughs) <laughs> um but every single time I say to someone oh I've got half of a kidney they go what one and a half no half of one how are you alive yeah <laughs> have you had a transplant no so are you on the list for one or no. so you have a half kidney yeah I've got half a kidney and it fully fun- like your it f- functions mostly normally or mostly normal I think um obviously it's a bit lower than average but yeah it's that's impressive are you uh susceptible to infections then like I had um when I was younger I was really susceptible to UTIs and then um I had one really bad kidney infection that led to me being hospitalized for three weeks um yeah, that, that scared the bejeebus out of my parents. Imagine. They thought I wasn't going to make it through that. Um, so that, that was a fun time. Um, I don't do things by half. No. Uh, uh, my kidney. Um, yeah, I had that. And I think, yeah, I went through chemo for that when I was two, one and a half, two. And that was the point where my dad met my mum. I mean, my mum tells me a story of the first time that she came round to the house and dad came to the door. And at that point, we had a little window in our front door and she came to the front door and saw my dad holding me, bearing in mind I was on chemo at that point. So she was just like, it was actually really scary. <laughs> and I was like, yeah. I can imagine. I can imagine. Mm. It's a bit intimidating. Yeah. So with you only having the half a kidney is is that where the chronic kidney disease came from or was that prior to that no that was caused by the cancer itself so um obviously with the half kidney it does decrease your kidney function um so yeah that's where the chronic kidney disease came from honestly i i'm you to be so happy you just literally inspiring me right now young lady you really are i'm reading about the wilms tumor as well as we are talking Mm. I don't know how much you read up on them. I, th- I think you're quite. Um, there's a lot, of, not not about survival rate of children with it. Um, it has like a five year survival rate, a four year survival rate, and stuff like that. And you're 19. Mm. Like, yeah, warrior. I, mean, I think they. I think I remember my mum telling me that the doctor said to her after I came, after I got into remission, it was all over, done with, done and dusted uh beat cancer onto the next thing um she was just like the doctors keep saying to me if she um she must last two years off chemo I think it was one and a half two years 18 months something like that Mm -hmm. um there was a certain amount of time that I had to be okay after the cancer and after it without my kidney failing before they'd even consider putting me on the transplant list so my mum I remember her telling me how she she'd give me all the veg she'd be making sure that I was drinking enough she was like you are not having a failing kidney no thank you we are looking after that half a kidney yeah it seems to have worked <laughs> <I'm here. laughs> so are you on the transplant list then no never have been it never needed to be no that is incredible I'm just incredible (laughs) so because your chronic kidney disease has come from a different way i guess than the norm 
um, do you get the what they call standard symptoms, which are tiredness, swollen ankle, shortness of breath, feeling sick, and blood in your urine? Like, um, I don't get anything other than the tiredness. Um, I get really tired really easily. Mm -hmm. I mean, especially now I'm at uni, I think I can definitely see the difference between me and some of my friends. Like my friends will be happy, you know, go out until, you know, three in the morning and, and you know, have a party all night. And I'm, I'm sat in, in bed at 10. <laughs> I'm, I'm sat, like, my friends are just like, do you want to go out? And I was like, no, I'm going to bed. But thanks for the invite. Can you drink alcohol? Uh, I do drink alcohol. But I mean, I'm not a major drinker of alcohol naturally. Mm. I'm just not bothered. I think the most I can manage is like two cocktails and I'm done because um, I get I get tipsy quite easily. Um, so, but I mean, I won't push myself beyond the point of feeling tipsy because I'm too scared of what that might do to my kidney. Absolutely. I think I'm quite sensible with my alcohol. In fairness, I haven't, I can't remember the last time I drank alcohol. Actually, that's a complete lie. <laughs> my parents came up and visited me at um, uni and um, we went out to a cocktail bar and I had a cocktail and that was it. But because I hadn't drunk in a while, it hit me like yeah. a ton of bricks. Um, so I stopped after that. Um, but yeah, I can drink alcohol. I've never been told that I can't. It's just managing it effectively. Yeah. And it's good to hear that you're, you're being so sensible that some people go the opposite way after they've been through so much. They kind of go into the, the I will do what I want to do. You can't control me no more stage. It's quite common, um, more than you think. So it's it's nice to hear that, you know, you've had this great support and um, you're doing so well with like going through uni and stuff like that and that you're still taking care of you. Um, mm. It's really wonderful. Yeah. To it really is. So with the the kidney disease, do you need to take medication regularly to maintain your kidneys then? So what, what sort of yeah. medication is it to you? Um, I take blood pressure medication because I've got high blood pressure, which I think is a result of the chronic kidney disease. Okay. Um, and then I've also, because of the Beckwith Biedemann, actually, no, it's not because of the Beckwith Biedemann, it's because of the chronic kidney disease. Again, I don't produce vitamin D whatsoever. So even if I went out into the sun, I wouldn't get any vitamin D from it. So I have to take two vitamin D medications to ensure that I actually get vitamin D in my system. Yeah. And obviously with my leg issues, that's really important because, you know, bones yep. need vitamin D. So no matter how much fortified food I eat, I won't get any, okay. any extra vitamin D from that. Wow. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I don't produce it whatsoever. That's another common misconception. If I tell people, oh, I don't produce vitamin D, some people will think, do you not get it from the sun? And I was like, no, I don't produce it, full stop. So your body can't convert it from whatever input it receives? Mm -mm. I think that's because of the fact that I've only got half a kidney. So, you know, to ask my kidney to actually produce the vital vitamins myself is a bit too much. The poor kidney's going, please, I can't do any more. <laughs> I can't do any more. I'm keeping you alive. Isn't that enough? <laughs> do you, uh, you know, you're just saying about people saying uh, about going in the sun and that lot. Do you get what I call the standard? Um, well, if you drunk probiotic juice, um, do you get that kind of advice from people around you or strangers that hear about your story? Do you get the, 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 this, this will help. This will fix you um I haven't had that from people I think the majority of the reactions have gone along the lines of how are you alive how are you standing in front of me and I just think I'm still working that out myself <laughs> well when you figured it out let us know <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah I don't think I've ever had that from people I know that when I was younger my doctors would you know tell me to drink probiotics just purely for the purposes of keeping my system healthy mm -hmm. and ensuring that nothing happened to you know help my kidney do its job because obviously with the kidney only having half of it it does kind of 
mean that I have to be more careful with what I eat and yeah. things like that. I need to make sure that I'm eating healthy so that, you know, I don't have issues and it's, yeah. it requires a lot more concentration. <laughs> Yeah, I was going to ask, is there a specific diet you follow or are you, are you told there's, should it be high fibre, low fibre or, you know, all that kind of stuff? Is there a specific? No, there isn't a specific diet. I think my mum was always just told that I need to just eat really healthy mm-hmm. because I can't afford to get constipated or anything because right. that can cause issues with my kidney. Because obviously it all intertwines. So, you know, I have to make sure that I'm eating enough veg and fruit each day and you know just making sure that it's all working the way it should do yeah absolutely you've never had to have any um kidney treatment like dialysis or anything have you Mm-mm. no well, that's good yeah so just going back to the brain hemorrhage mm-hmm. um i know we're going back quite a way okay. but um you suffer with epilepsy correct i do okay is that has that stemmed from the brain hemorrhage i'm not sure um I have to say I don't know it could have been like an onset but it could also just be a completely unrelated thing I just developed it and here we are but I feel like in myself it's probably more related to you know the past stuff that I've had gone wrong with my brain yeah I don't I don't know whether it was triggered by the brain hemorrhage or anything I don't know okay you haven't you didn't have epilepsy from birth this is something you developed sort of through childhood was it yeah I developed it through childhood I had a seizure I mean my main trigger is tiredness so obviously I have to make sure that I sleep enough um because otherwise I'm constantly on edge and there's no telltale signs for me that I'm gonna have a seizure okay I don't feel ill or anything the only way that I can prevent it is by not getting tired because there's no other trigger that I can uh, think of that's ever caused a seizure because I had, I mean, my first seizure was after my after a wedding where um, I'd stayed up really late and I was quite young at this point. So I'd stayed up late and didn't sleep in enough. And then I ended up having a seizure um, I do laugh about some of them now because obviously seizures come uninvited. They don't come in the most convenient times sometimes. I mean, I've only had three major ones. I had a full tonic clonic um, after that wedding uh, when I was absolutely shattered. Mm -hmm. Um, And I was stubborn when I was younger, so I wouldn't lie in. Um, And I ended up falling off a high stool and banging my head on the ground two or three days later I had pictures at school and I had a massive (laughs) lump on my forehead where I'd fallen and hit it and then my second one was an absence seizure where I just completely blanked out there was nothing like I remember my dad telling me that at first he thought that I was ignoring him Mm-hmm. So he got a bit frustrated. So he was like, Maisie, why aren't you listening to me? Turns out I was having an absence seizure while I was helping him clean the bike because I think I was tired the night before um, and hadn't slept enough. And then the third major one was in 2017 when I came back from America. Luckily, it wasn't in America. I just, <laughs> I just, escaped. I just escaped that by the skin of my teeth. Um, but I, I had a seizure in the shower. Oh. Yeah. Um, and because I'm so tall, my legs locked the door. So my parents couldn't get to me either. Oh, no. And was this another, like, the a tonic clonic? Tonic clonic. And the shower was was going. Um, the water ran cold. I remember my parents saying, we just heard a bang and we went up, saw you seizing in the shower. And then... Um, I do laugh about it now because it was the most undignified place <laughs> I would see her. And especially as the two paramedics, bless them, were both male. Oh my goodness. And then my mum went, we covered you up. And I was like, that's not the point. It's still mortifying. Bless you. They got really worried at one point because I think it was quite a long seizure. Because I was absolutely shattered. 
because jet lag on top of the fact because we swapped between time zones mm-hmm. a few times. So, because we went to a couple different states, so yeah. we were swapping time zones, and I didn't have time to adjust between. And I got back, and I was just shattered. And then I just seized in the shower, and I think it was a really long one, and they were starting to get quite worried. I think it was a good like five, seven minutes. And the worry that they had, obviously, was obviously the shower, the water was running cold. So they didn't want me to get, like, really, really cold. Mm -hmm. And my dad was trying to turn the shower off. Um, But obviously they couldn't get to me because my leg had blocked the door. So, again, I don't do things by half. I don't make things easy for people. But, um, yeah, that that wasn't the finest moment. (laughs) Well, I'm going to get one to two questions, really. Well, not two questions, comment and question. Um, I'm guessing things that travel like that then is a bit of a no-go for you then for for jet lag. and. I mean, I can travel. I think if I did go to America again, I'd just have to be really much more careful because I think the problem that we had was that, obviously, the last leg of our... We did, like, a not road trip, but we travelled a bit round America to see family. So we went to Delaware, then we went to California. So we spent about a week and a half in Delaware, or a week in Delaware, a week and a half in California, then three days in New York. Oh, so you did like what? off to the West Coast and then right back to East Coast and then home. So that's yeah. see, three different time zones. See, like looking back on it now, all three of us would say to ourselves, yeah, I think we should have gone New York, California, Delaware. Because then you've got you're less going work. In one direction. Yeah, you're going in one direction, and obviously it's eight hours in an eight-hour difference in California and New York. I'm assuming, I don't know, and then five hours in Delaware. So it's much more easy to adapt to the change. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think looking back on it in hindsight, we should have done it that way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can travel. It just it will require me to be a lot more careful when it comes to jet lag. Um, sure. I mean, since then, we kind of avoided going anywhere with a massive time difference because I think I kind of traumatized my parents slightly because they they're so worried. But I think the problem was is that I couldn't sleep on the plane home either. Um, I just could not sleep. My body was just no. Not comfortable, are they? No, and I mean, I was sat up watching films for a bit, so that was my doing. So I think. If I went to America again, which we want to do, but obviously we definitely do it a bit differently. That's yeah. for sure. Um, you mentioned two different types of seizures there. Can you explain the difference between the two for us? Yeah. So a tonic clonic is the big kind of stereotypical seizure where you're on the ground shaking, mm-hmm. eyes rolling back, foaming at the mouth type thing. Um, you know, the typical image of a seizure. Um, And then an absence is where you just completely blank. It's like you zone out, but you're not conscious that you're doing that. Yeah, and not like disassociating from from where you are and just vanishing. It's more just kind of, you've got no awareness what's going on. Yeah, you almost feel like you're asleep, but... I mean, I don't really know how to describe it. It's kind of, obviously, you're not conscious while you're doing it. So I'm, I, I remember my dad just saying that I literally, I was stood there just staring and that's it. Mm-hmm. Like you, you couldn't get my attention. I don't know. It's kind of hard to describe, but essentially you just zone out and you're staring. Yeah. Yeah. And um, no one can get your attention until you come round from it. The, the, um, the, the what, internet's definitions are um, jerking and shaking uncontrollably fit. Um, or losing awareness and staring blankly into space and becoming stiff, the body becoming yeah. uh, stiff. So that sounds like it, it's, that sounds like the two that, that you were just explaining. Yeah. Have you had much investigation done with the epilepsy then, on neurology or? Um, I had an EEG where they diagnosed me with it. But other than that, I haven't had any further investigations as such. Um, I was on medication for it for a while, but then they stopped it when I hit puberty because I think the medication that I was on put me at risk of of PCOS, so they didn't really want to risk it. Ironically enough, I still developed ovarian cysts after that, 
but um yeah I haven't got PCOS so that's good at least yeah absolutely it was actually something I'd written down to ask you about because I know you'd mentioned it earlier so. yeah yeah there was something else I wanted to ask about the epilepsy and it was one of the symptoms that we had found with the research um I know you said there's nothing that you, you don't get any aura or anything prior to a seizure ha- seizure happening no. but is there anything do you get any sort of strange smells or tastes or any sensations either during or after um I mean it's hard to say because I don't I, I mean after I've had a seizure I don't remember anything hmm. I think that's the problem because I, I can't say whether I, I don't think I do from my memory. I don't think I've ever had any inclination that I'm about to have one. It just happens. I mean, all I know is that after I have a seizure, I get really, really emotional. Like, I remember after all of them, I've sat and cried for a while. Um, mm-hmm. And then after my big tonic clonic seizure after America, I slept for about 16 hours straight. Wow. I can imagine with all the body though going into this spasmodic fit um, that it must be so ridiculously exhausting for yeah. the body and mind that emotions and sleep is definitely the first thing that my body would want to do after something like that you know yeah. I think because that one was such a long one as well mm. but I think my parents were starting to get worried that I wasn't going to come round from it yeah it was so massive I think by the time they'd managed to get me out of the shower, I'd stopped seizing um, because obviously they couldn't move the shower door until I stopped seizing. But I think my head was under the water. So they had they had that worry. So I think my dad was trying to move the shower head away and then the shower was running cold and it was all just a bit of a nightmare. <laughs> but yeah, it was such a long seizure that I just completely wiped out. There's apparently something called um, a rescue medicine. There's a young girl on... Um, TikTok um, called Tegan and she has them all day long and mm-hmm. she has something called a rescue medicine is that something you've ever been spoken to about just in case that your seizure doesn't calm down no I don't think I've I think the only medication that I've ever been looked at for was the um, medication that I was on to manage my seizures I mean I haven't had a seizure since that big one in 2017 Oh wow. Okay. So they're not freak they're not frequent then. It's just as like a sporadic. Yeah. You're managing it very well then. You obviously are mm. taking definitely taking good care of yourself to um not get so tired that your body Yeah. Is. I mean, it's in cases of extreme tiredness. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, if I didn't sleep for close to a week, if I was if I'd had barely any sleep for about a week straight, I'd be in dangerous territory but I mean anyone would let's be honest yeah 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 um yeah but I mean having said that you know I do have occasions where you know every every couple of nights or something I'll have a couple of nights where I've got like dodgy sleep and I keep calling my mum being like I'm not gonna have a seizure am I because I really don't want to have a seizure and then my mum's just like Maisie you will be fine (laughs) that they were they were like extreme tiredness levels Mm -hmm. but obviously I take care of myself and I don't push myself during the day yeah you know that if you've had those poor nights of sleep not to push it if I if I've had poor nights of sleep I will just chill out for the day Mm -hmm. and that'll just be my plans uh and then I'll just get an early night so it's definitely required me to take a lot more attention and pay a lot more attention to my body Mm -hmm. if I'm feeling tired I will you know chill out for the day I'm not going to push myself it's really good way I think and and, and like I said before you seem to take really good care of your body and really listen to it you're really in tune to it which is fantastic it really is with all of the different conditions all of the potential triggers you just have to be so hyper aware of every part of your body yeah I think when I was younger I wasn't as hyper aware and I think the lack of hyper awareness led me to have the kidney infection that got me into hospital for three weeks Mm -hmm. um so then since then my mum's been like right you need to drink every hour you need to drink from that point onwards it was really hammered home you know everyone was worried that my kidney was going to keel over because obviously there's only half of one it's different when you've got two kidneys yeah, and you've got I still nothing spare. one that's 
fine because you can just get antibiotics and it'll go. But with me, it was awful because it was so painful. But yeah, I've definitely since then been stepping it up and, you know, that's triggered the hyper awareness, I think. Yeah. I mean, um, I, I suffer, I mentioned it a lot in my lives, with recurring kidney infections. And for me, I have two kidneys and it's always my left one. <laughs> and, and it's awful for somebody with two kidneys to have that much pain. I cannot even, I don't, I don't, don't know how you do it. Don't know how you went through it. Don't know how you did it. Yeah. It, it, it wasn't fun. That's no. for sure. It was not fun. So there's one other we haven't touched on yet. <laughs> As if the list wasn't long enough already for you. <laughs> um, you also have asthma. I do. I do. And again, sad from since childhood, yeah. early childhood. Yeah, fairly early childhood. Um, it's not severe, but it's there. I mean, it it definitely flares up when I have colds. There is zero doubt in my mind. Obviously, with the asthma, I always develop a cough when I've got a cold. So it's just a matter of keeping on top of my inhalers and making sure that I don't produce a chest infection because that quite often can happen when I've got a cold it happens more when I was younger like now with my medications I can kind of regulate it and I often I won't need to you know have antibiotics for a chest infection anymore because it's kind of well regulated um <laughs> but yeah so with your with your um your asthma would you say it's mild yeah yeah definitely is it just the one inhaler or do you have like a steroidal i've got i've got a purple one and i've got the blue one it's the blue one i only use when i need it mm -hmm. like when i've got a cold or if i feel a bit chesty and a bit wheezy or something then i'll take it but my purple one i take twice a day so yeah and with all this going on with the whole this the back the back with the chronic kidney disease the epilepsy the asthma the hydrocephalus Except for this um do you suffer with your mental health a lot yes yeah my I've got really bad anxiety I mean it I have been quite anxious in the past I think I was kind of almost destined to be quite an anxious person um I mean when I was younger I had issues where I think the problem was is because obviously my parents and I have gone through so much together that I'd have awful separation anxiety mm. where if I was going to stay at someone's house I'd be like I want to go home I want to go mm. home I just want to go home um, yeah. I've only ever managed to do one residential trip and even then it was hell because I wanted to be with my parents you know this was when I was nine I think it was a year four trip to like a a, a little village nearby it was like 15 minutes away from home and I remember like sleepovers I'm still rocky on now um it's really tough for me to kind of deal with it and I mean obviously moving to university was a big thing and it still does wrench me a bit quite a bit when I've got to leave my parents or you know they leave me but yeah I think I'm more settled at uni now so it's a bit easier um, and I think it will begin to get easier and easier as time goes on. Obviously, I've been home a couple of times since being at uni and coming back, I think, yeah, it was last time because I'd been away from uni for about two weeks. I came back and the problem was, was that I was really forgetful and forgot. Um, I left my medication at the house and I didn't have a spare set of medication at uni. So we got about 40 minutes down the road and I was fine. And I went, medication, I've forgotten my medication. No. So I go back. And then I went back to my house and I was like, I've actually got to leave now. And then I went back to uni and that was really tough. The first couple of days after I got back were, were really quite tough. I was missing home quite a lot, I think, as well, because I've always been such like a home bird that it's kind of being away from home for this amount of time is so strange because I've never been that far away you know I've never been able to manage even sleepovers let alone going to university 
of being two, three, four hours away from home. I mean, my anxiety just generally just crops up every so often. Mm. Um, I'm a chronic overthinker. Do you think a bit, a bit about being away from your family is because with your health, you've had them all the time and been with them all the time and you're scared that something could possibly happen and they're not going to be there? Yeah, I mean, possibly. I mean, that's probably part of it. But I think I was saying to my mum a few weeks back, because um, we were talking about this, and I was saying how the only times when I was younger that I was forced to be away from home or away from my parents was when something bad was happening and I was in hospital. So I think my brain just kind of freaks out. It assumes something's bad's going to happen because every time previously that you've been apart from them, that's when something bad's happened. Yeah, because I've kind of, I think my brain is kind of conditioned into thinking, hold on, you're out of the safety net. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot, you know, you need to go back in. And I kept saying to myself before I started uni, I was like, you've got to, you've got to push past it. You've got to do this. You've got to do this. And I mean, my parents were great about it. They were just like, look, if there's at any point that you just don't feel comfortable going to uni, you decide uni's not for you, you know, you can stop and you can come home and it'll be it will all be fine. We will support mm-hmm. you no matter what. But I think um I was determined to kind of do this for myself. Yeah. Because I needed to kind of prove to myself that I could do it. And I mean, I made my best friend laugh because I've never been able to go through an entire sleepover with her without feeling really homesick. Um, And I said to her, I was like, now that I've been at uni for about two months, maybe I can sleep around yours without crying. But yeah, (laughs) she she was just like, finally, woo. (laughs) How long have you got left at uni? Um, How long have I got left? Well, I'm only in first year now, so I've got two years left. I'm in halls at the moment. It's hectic, but it's fun. But do you find that now that you've been there for a little while, is it getting easier every time when you go back home and leave again that you sort of know that you do have your comforts with uni, with your friends and things there as well? Has any of that eased? Yeah, I think it has. Um, Since being here for a while, um, it's definitely reduced. Obviously, I do still have the wobbles. I mean, the other day, even, I had a bit of a wobble. I was like, because, oh. <laughs> I mean, at that point, I was quite tired as well. So I, cause that was after, like, a five-hour sleep. Mm. And I was just like, okay, I just need to kind of have a bit of a cry, process the emotions, and then we'll be fine. But I think that in the past, um, prior to the whole homesickness thing, I when I was 12, 13... I know I mentioned earlier that I switched schools um, Mm -hmm. and the original school that I was at beforehand, my primary school, great, fun, great, loved it. But then as soon as I went to high school, I really struggled Um, with the hydrocephalus. I actually didn't mention this earlier, but um, it gives me, it kind of gives me autism type symptoms. Mm -hmm. Some of them, um, like the, inability to understand certain social cues right. sarcasm I just can't I have to I have to look at someone and be like are you being sarcastic or are you actually being serious and my friends have got used to that now but um, <laughs> it, it was really frustrating because when I was younger obviously I didn't know how to deal with it yeah. I was only 12 13 so once I got to high school I really struggled and I really struggle with change as it is. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that those that first kind of year and a bit were really difficult. Um, and I did end up getting quite depressed. I was really struggling. That is the lowest I've ever felt mm-hmm. in my entire life. It was awful. And I developed depression and anxiety. Oh, I wouldn't say I dep- developed depression as a whole. I think... I just became quite depressed. Mm -hmm. I was never formally diagnosed with depression, Mm -hmm. but there were definitely certain symptoms that pointed in that direction at that point in time. And then from that point onwards, I've had severe, and not severe, but moderate anxiety throughout. Um, 
I got quite isolated at the old school and then my parents moved me to somewhere else and it was the best thing they could have done because that that school genuinely saved me because I wouldn't I wouldn't be doing as well as I am now if I hadn't have moved to that second high school yeah but honestly it it was the best thing they could have done for me it's fantastic it's nice to hear like again again about the support you know there's one thing getting support for physical health but mental health which is not so visible is um, a lot harder to get it for and, and it sounds like you've got a great team of family and friends behind you yeah I mean I went through a bit of a lower phase in around year 11 mm-hmm. where some friendship group issues caused me to go a bit low mm-hmm. um, and I did go to my GP at that point because I know I was worried about it my parents were worried about it and he said look I can refer you to calms but just so you know it'll be a long wait so I ended up well I mean they put a referral in for calms actually to be fair I don't think we even bothered referring to calms because they were just like it could be up to like two years wait and I was thinking I'm sorry no um absolutely not and then my parents got me a private counsellor who came to the house and it it was really really helpful and she's actually come out a couple of times after that when I had a few issues that I needed to be talked through Mm -hmm. um yeah that really helped because I think I think what is disappointing though I think is the fact that children's mental health services you've got to be at a certain point before they'll even consider you and even then when you're at your lowest point they won't see you like the amount of different stories that I've heard from people and as soon as my GP was just like, look, I'm re- I can refer you to calms, but it'll be a two year wait. I was just sat there thinking, absolutely not. It's awful. If you're yeah. going to the GP at that point because you've hit your lowest and you're, you, you know, you're scaring yourself at that point whenever you're going to see your GP, otherwise you wouldn't reach out for help because you know you're not yourself. That's yeah. the point there and then that you need help, not two years later. Because I mean, I never got to the point where I was, you know, having suicidal suicidal yeah. thoughts or anything. I never got to that point because yeah. I think because my support network was so good, my parents noticed as soon as I started to go a bit low, yeah. as soon as I started to dip, they were just like, right, we need to sort it out. Mm-hmm. Like, we'll put you back to the council that we can sort it out. So I never got to the point where I was having suicidal thoughts. Mm -hmm. After that, I am going to be eternally grateful because, God, I don't know what would have happened. I mean, my parents keep saying to me, if we hadn't have moved you to the school you went to, you would probably be in a far worse state, potentially not here anymore, Mm -hmm. because I was really, really low. It's the lowest I've ever felt. And it was really tough because for a 13-year-old to go through all of that and not know how to deal with it. Yeah. Um, because you're still figuring out what's happening to you in your body and everything, and puberty's a nightmare. And on top of that, you're also developing like overthinking tendencies and anxiety, and it's all just bundled up into this kind of nightmarish package plus all of your existing conditions and the symptoms that came along with that for you too exactly um and it was just a lot to think about and I think with the combination of me having those pre-existing conditions and then also feeling really isolated at my old school it was horrific Uh, I can't imagine how awful it was for my parents as well yeah to see me be that low because I've always been like a really happy person. Yeah. I mean, I think um, for teenage, when you start coming to the teenage years, everybody goes through a dip in their mental health. It's it's something that's quite common. But when you've got so much more going on for you, yeah. um, it's, I can't, I mean, I went through it as a 13 year old. That's before I got sick. And, and for me, life was the worst thing it could ever be. And we had to wait years back then too. Um, my mum ended up paying for a private therapist and I believe the same thing that if she hadn't have done that 
I would I dread to think where I would have gotten to. The system it definitely fails the, the, that that age group. But like I said, to have your health on top of that, that just I, I dread to think where I would be if I didn't get the help that I did when I was 13. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's all credit goes to them because, you know, without their support and everything, I wouldn't be where I am. Yeah. So, you know, I'm so grateful that they got me the help when I needed it. And I mean, I do struggle at times with anxiety attacks and thinking. I mean, when I was in year 11, I think because I'm such an overthinker, you've got that whole what if they're annoyed at me what if this happens wait they're not they're not replying to my text straight away what have I done and that's the problem because it's it's persistent yeah people say oh you can just control it mm -hmm. no I can't control it um breathing exercises don't always control what your what your mind does exactly uh, you know it different techniques work for different people yes. uh say breathing exercises breathing in a box might work for some people but not for me when I'm when I'm having an anxiety attack all I want to do is curl up in a ball and watch my favorite tv show mm -hmm. and then sleep and then the next morning I, I will be fine and that's your that's and that's what you do is it mm. that was going to be my next question to you like do you have um something that you can use to calm yourself down yeah I mean I've got a comfort cushion Mm -hmm. that I use um and I mean I I have that with me every night um I can't sleep without it it's just there I remember one time I I went on holiday with my parents um to Cornwall it was this year and I left my cushion at the holiday house and I realized about an hour into the journey I've left my I've left my cushion at the house mum what the hell am I doing what 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 Mm -hmm. you know I need the I need the cushion and then my parents were just like right we'll phone them they'll send it back it'll be fine maybe it'll be fine but then here's me crying in the back of the car because I don't have this cushion that I need mm -hmm. um, and I think also that kind of comes along with the hydrocephalus type thing because obviously I think one of the common or I could be misinterpreting this but with my I know, need to have like a comfort item. Yeah. I I don't know whether that's an association with autism type symptoms, but I think I've heard some people, but I don't know. But regardless, I have this I have this cushion. It is my comfort item. If I don't have it with me, it's all hell will break loose. <laughs> yeah. So that that was not fun. But then luckily they sent it back first class and it was with me within a couple of days. So I got it back. If I'm like having an anxiety attack, I will go into my room. I will have time to myself and I will calm myself down. I also tend to listen to ASMR to get me to sleep every night um, because I can't do it without it. Mm -hmm. So I've got that combination. Mm -hmm. Kind of like a comforting thing. It's a routine. It's a comforting routine. And I can't yeah. break out of my routines because I get stressed. And that's where the hydrocephalus comes in. Because if I break out on my routine, if there's a sudden change in routine, I get anxious. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that cushion enough is an example. Mm -hmm. That was that sudden jolt of, oh God, I haven't got that. And you know, it's sinking feeling. It's that sinking feeling of, am I going to be able to sleep tonight? What if I don't sleep tonight? And then we get into the whole, yeah, but then you'll get overtired and then you might have a seizure. And then it's kind of one thing after another. It after spirals. Another. It just spirals. Like um, I've got my little routine at uni now where I'll come in from my lectures and I'll spend time by myself. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a naturally very introverted person. Mm -hmm. I will, I would much rather have a night in to myself and watch a film than go out clubbing. I don't want to go out clubbing. <laughs> least of all because of covid and i'm scared i'm gonna get covid mm -hmm. i had to juggle and change my routine around but i've now got one where i'll come in from my lectures or whatever i'm doing that day i'll do any work that i need to do at my desk and then i'll have a shower get changed into my pjs snuggle down with my cushion and watch a film or a tv show and while everyone else is going out in my flat 
I'm sat in my room just you know trying to decompress yeah too much social interaction just completely tires me out um I am the literal epitome of an introvert <laughs> you're in very similar company <laughs> very similar company even when we um have a zoom together just to chill out we just put a movie on yeah half the time we don't talk to each other we're just yeah, sitting like, we don't we just sit <laughs> well we're doing a craft I mean we're watching a movie and that's how I ch- but we you know the other person's there it's a zoom call and, and it's great there with the routine as well every night I'll call my parents um yeah. we'll have a FaceTime I'll have a catch-up about how my day is going and my parents said to me when I got to uni they were just like you're probably going to get bored of doing this and I was like no I won't because it's my little routine well it's so different than if you were in the house with them if you're going home from uni at the end of the day to the house you'd be going home and having a conversation with them too so it's you've got that chance to catch up it probably helps with processing this what's happened in the day too yeah you've got something to share it with without having to go out <laughs> yeah okay. um it's such an important point though because the reason that we want to have control and know what's happening when and have that structure is because so much of conditions and our health is out of our control so mm-hmm. we try to just clutch on to everything that we can control because it brings us that comfort right yeah I think I think that definitely comes into it because obviously throughout my life I have not been in control of what's been happening no. So now that I'm able to be in control 19 years down the line, I'm not going to waste that control. So I exactly. yeah. grab on to whatever I can find and that's the control that I've got in my life and I'm going to keep it that way. Yeah, I like my routines. I like sticking to them. And, yeah. you know, that's that. And I mean, every so often I will push myself, mm-hmm. not to the point where I think it's going to damage my mental health yeah um because I'm not going to do that no um it's not worth it no it's not just for the sake of going out for one night I'm not going to do it I mean I'm not ashamed to say that I'm 19 and have never been clubbing in my life you're not missing anything no (laughs) you're not yeah I mean oh it just doesn't appeal to me I'd much rather just sit on my bed and watch a film yeah Um, that's absolutely fine yeah, and I, you know, when Bake Off was on, I'd watch Bake Off every Tuesday on FaceTime with my parents. And I watch I'm a Celeb, and my dad texts me during it. Love that. And, Love you know, that. So good. Obviously, I am three hours away from them. Yeah. It makes it a lot harder for them because I know my parents don't like that I'm away. They love yeah. that I'm doing my own thing, but I know they find it hard that I'm kind of out of the home. In a sense, I'm glad that we did, that I did it at this point in their lives as well. Mm-hmm. My dad's just retired and then we've moved house, we've moved out of the family home. So they don't have to put up with seeing the home that I grew up in yeah. empty and without me. It's like a new start for everybody. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Allows them to kind of have a bit of a, not coping mechanism, but a way to kind of distract themselves from yeah. it. I wanted to ask um, just something quickly, going back to medical stuff. Um, So you mentioned earlier about high blood pressure. Mm -hmm. Um, Is that an ongoing thing? And if it is, are you medicated or was it just something that happened at a specific time during your journey? Um, I think it got onset by the chronic kidney disease. And then, uh, yeah, obviously they had the worry with my mum whether I would develop a heart issue. Mm -hmm. Thankfully, I haven't, and it's fine. But, um, yeah, that's ongoing, and I'm medicated for that. I'm not on a high dose of medication, but I am medicated for it. I mean, I remember one time when I had that kidney infection, actually, Mm -hmm. my blood pressure, Jesus, it was very high. 138, I think it was, (laughs) at the highest, potentially up to 140 you was young wasn't you yeah I was I was 14 and I remember looking at the uh blood pressure monitor and going oh that's not good because the problem was is obviously your blood pressure raises yeah when you're panicking and so when I looked at the high blood pressure started panicking and it shot right up but I mean when I was younger I mean 
from the start I've been medicated but obviously the medications have changed as I've grown older yeah um I think my nephrologist said to my mum that ideally the top number needed to be below 100 when I was younger but obviously the average blood pressure reading goes up as you Mm -hmm. it changes as you grow older so they're not as worried about that now um I remember being so excited when it got to 99 once um (laughs) It wasn't often, to be honest, it was below 100 because you get white coat syndrome, don't you? Mm-hmm. And you start getting worried when you're at the doctor's. Yeah. It's the least reliable way of checking your blood pressure when you're panicked about going to the doctor. Exactly. Every time I go in, it's, um, oh, your blood pressure's a bit high. No shit. You're taking it in the GP surgery. Yeah. It's going to be up. Do it at home and trust me, it'll be half of this. <laughs> I mean, I've had several like ambulatory blood pressure reading things, and I think that's when they found that I had high blood pressure. Mm-hmm. When I was younger, the average would be, I mean, when, whenever I got them tested, it would be up to like one twenties, and then they'd be like, "Oh, it's a bit high." No shit, I'm in a doctor's office, <laughs> and again, anxiety <laughs> plays into it as well. Okay. Um, and then they were just like. Right, we'll try it on the other arm. That um, arm's no less anxious than this arm. So, <laughs> I appreciate your trying to do your job, but how's this arm going to be any better than this arm? Oh my God. I mean, what they should do is do it, to get it more accurate, is they should do it after you've been to the doctors. Yeah. Do your vital signs after you've been to see the doctor. Because yeah. then that's over, and it's done, and you don't have anything to be anxious about. Yeah. And then, yeah. hey presto. Oh, your blood pressure's gone down. Oh, I'm surprised. Oh, yeah, quite surprised. I'm so using that nail and it's going to the doctor and they say to me, well, let's try that arm. I'm going to literally say, well, that arm's no anxious. I'm like, no, less anxious than that arm. <laughs> I'm literally going to use that now. I really am. You should, you should definitely use that. Can't wait to tell them who told, told me to say it either. I'll be like, hey, tell me. <laughs> hey, and he said it. Be like, who's Haley? I'll, 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 I'll give you a number. <laughs> <laughs> Speak to her for me. I think that's me for questions. I think so. Yeah. It was oh, so interesting. Literally so interesting. So interesting. Just, I'm my so gobsmacked by half of it. Mm. You, you, the, good, the good thing about this, this podcast was that you are so knowledgeable about your condition prior to being born. Mm. Which with your condition is so important because it's where it all starts. Mm. You'd start saying, well, I don't really know much about that. And then you tell us everything you know about it. And it's like, <laughs> yeah. you know more you than know a lot. lot. Yeah. <laughs> I was just going to say, I'm sure a lot of it was difficult to talk about too, because mm. obviously you're bringing up all of the stuff you've been through from such a young age, just the physical stuff, first of all, and then also the mental health side of it too, and all the stuff with your family and things like that as well. So it was tough to share that, I'm sure. Yeah, it was tough, but I'm really glad that I raised awareness for it all yeah. like a lot of my conditions no one's even heard of no. I mean I mean I forgot to mention this earlier but it's the simple things like with my different size feet getting shoes is a nightmare I totally meant to ask this earlier when that you mentioned about the legs shoes I meant to ask about trousers like how do you get trousers but... that's a note I put down clothing yeah I mean I am quite tall, so that's a nightmare as well. Um, but yeah, I've got one size six and a half and one size ten and a half, so I cross between men's and women's. Wow. How? how, how... Exactly. <laughs> so I, my, my, thought was, my thought was, how can you get a girl's shoe and a boy's shoe that's the same? I mean, there's certain companies that do it, but at the same time, the problem with men's shoes is that their feet are wider. Mm-hmm. And I don't have wide feet. I've got, you know, normal, but just that one's bigger than the other. And the problem we had for many years is that we couldn't figure out what to do with the spare pair. Oh, yeah. Um, so my mum actually found a Facebook group. The name of it escapes me. But she found a Facebook group where people like amputees or mm-hmm. people with odd shoes could purchase the, the you know, the spare shoes and That's hey, genius. yeah literally genius. Oh. <laughs> you blew my mind 
for years we had boxes and boxes of spare shoes in our cupboards. It was awful because um, we didn't know what to do with them and we ended up having to throw away pairs of expensive shoes. Just the upside, you can wear Dot Martens. I can. I got my first pair and it was great because they go up into adult size, like um, the two sizes. And he did actually put together a pair for me, which was really nice. Um, so oh, I, that was good of them. So I didn't have a spare, or maybe I did actually. I might be mixing up companies. Oops. Yeah. So I. That was bad of them. <laughs> that was bad. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, um, yeah. So I had. I've got a pair of Doc Martins that I um, got for my birthday. We are. I'm getting confused between companies here because I can't remember whether they made up a shoot like a pair for me. It sounds or, like something they would do though. I've heard a lot of good things about Dot Martins. Yeah, I, I really have. What about trousers? Do you struggle? Do you struggle with them, or do you just get like a a, a long pair and then cut like trim one up? Like yeah. I I have to get tall trousers mm -hmm. uh, all the time. It's a struggle to get trousers that will fit me all the way down to my ankles. Because my legs are abnormally long now. Like, it's ridiculous. I know that with jeans, especially, that's an absolute struggle. Because you're trying to find something that's not going to look really ridiculous. Yeah. But also, sometimes in the tall ranges, even, you can't get things that are going to go down to your ankles. So it's a real struggle to try and find some things. And, like, also with me, I have a few pair of cropped jeans but also, depending on the situation, I don't particularly like the cropped jeans, depending on the company that I'm with. Mm -hmm. I'm not ashamed of my scars. I love my scars. They make me who I am. But because of the leg lengthening, I've got like bullet wound type things in my legs. Mm -hmm. So I mean, with certain people, I will make up a bit of a story because I don't really want to have to explain the whole shebang. Mm -hmm. But yeah. It depends on who I'm with, but I mean, nine times out of ten, I will wear crop jeans and not give a damn. But um, every so often, you know, I'm just like, do I want to show off my bullet wounds today? Not really, yeah. not particularly. So um, I will just, you know, choose a longer pair of jeans. But I mean, nine times out of ten, I'm fine with it. Scott um, yeah. says um, stories about... Um, his scar and that lot he's fought dragons he's he's tackled sharks he was swimming he was he went out to florida i think it was he was surfing and there was a shark in the water I and mean, he told it what so before you know but it, it, the shark got a bite in beforehand and he 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 um is an exaggerator but it worked oh, people then just like laugh it off and then that's it it's done yeah um okay. so, yeah I, I need to learn that one. I'm very much with my stomach. I've got the holes and the drains and all that sort of stuff. And I I, I don't struggle with my main scar, but it's the, the little ones tucking this in and tucking them, pulling yeah. that in there. It's that it's them ones that I, that yeah. I personally struggle with. I struggle. I I have long legs. I'm not tall. I'm five foot eight. So I'm not overly tall, tall, but mm. and I buy long legs jeans everything and even I find sometimes that they're not long enough to even go to my ankles yeah and I'm sitting going you know if I'm buying long leg trousers and I'm not even six foot how do people cope who are any taller than me how do they get anything because clothing companies do not think that through right they really do not I mean I it, it makes me laugh I make my parents laugh when I say this but I'm the literal embodiment although it will be slightly younger of Miranda Hart Genuinely, yes I'm six foot. I'm the clumsiest woman you have ever met in your entire life. Like if there is something in front of me, including my own feet, to trip on, I will trip over it. I will walk into the lamp post. I walk into I walked into a lamp post the other day. I'm just so not with it. And like my my friend was laughing at me the other day because I didn't notice that the light had turned green. I was just in my own little world. And my friend had crossed the road and he said to me, Maisie, what are you doing? I pressed the button for the zebra crossing before realising, oh, I can go, it's green. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm so awful for that. I trip on thin air. Like, just air, I don't, I don't need yeah, even... Honestly, if there's anything to trip on there, I will do it. I trip on thin air too. Yeah. 
it's crazy. Really. Um, on that note, I think um, it's time to ask you to share um, a little bit about um, what charities you'd like to share and if you want to share your um, social medias or whatnot, um, this is your little space to do so. So take it away. Um, yeah, so the charity I sh chose was Shine, which is a charity supporting those with hydrocephalus and also spina bifida, which can sometimes come joined with hydrocephalus. I don't have it myself, but they help to support those who have those two conditions. Uh, also, in terms of social media, I mentioned earlier how I like reading. So I do have a book based TikTok account, uh, which is sapphire underscore is underscore reading. And yeah, I think that's everything as far as I know. Okay. Um, and yeah. And we'll link all that in the website um, below your little your little part. Yeah. So yeah. Anyone awesome. wants to follow them and the don a link to the donation um, site will also be there too. Brilliant. Yeah. Thank you. But honestly, we can't thank you enough for being here today, sharing as much as you have. And I'm sure everybody who knows you and doesn't know you is going to be so proud of what you've done and the way you've held yourself and spoken about it. And I think your dad's going to love you so much for telling us he's an inch shorter now. <laughs> I think that's going to be... <laughs> the tip of the iceberg. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you so much for sharing that with us too. No worries. <laughs> Um, as Ria said, you know, on a serious note, it, what you told us today was incredibly educational. You were inspirational. What you've gone through in 19 years is a hell of a lot more than any anybody would normally go through in a whole lifetime. So thank you for sharing all that and educating and definitely learned so much today about so many different conditions and how they can be linked to each other. Absolutely. Yeah, no worries. It was it was a pleasure. I'm really um Thank you for being so lovely about it. And once again, thank you for doing this. It's so lovely to be able to talk about my conditions in an open environment and raise awareness for them. It's just lovely. It's been awesome. Thank you so much. You're so welcome. And and thank you for teaching me to say words that I just, I could never, I could never have. And I would have never understood those conditions. There, I have them here on paper and reading them is one thing, but hearing you explain them, it just it just made me really understand and mm -hmm. the compassion I have for you and the, you know, you just are so inspiring. And you're 19, imagine what you're gonna be when you're my age. So thank you ever so much. And um, we wish you all the best. Please keep us updated on, on, on your journey and what you're doing and uni and just please keep in touch. Like, oh, we really, we'd love that. 100%, 100%. Wonderful. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, take care of yourself and yeah. um, we'll speak to you soon. Yeah, speak to you soon. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Bye. Bye. I loved her. Oh. oh my God. She's my favorite human. I love her. From the moment that she came in and she sat down, I just loved her. I just want to hug her. Absolutely. And I've, her parents did an amazing job. What an awesome pair of parents she has. The the comfort, the the support, the just all just all together, just it doesn't yeah. really, you don't even need that word. Just for me, it whole. was the understanding that they had. That was what blew me away the most. The fact that they were even just on the mental health side of things, they were so tuned in and aware and did exactly what she needed instead of just brushing it off as they easily could have done. And you know, just it, uh, I have no words. They're just they sound like the most supportive unit. I have heard of it's just mind-blowing and the dad what he went through with her on his own whilst mourning yeah the loss and then the 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 mom coming into her life and just being everything to her yeah I'm actually tearful just thinking about the whole network together mm -hmm. and how much love there must be in that household yeah blow my mind she really did and I and I, and I can say for both of us can't thank her enough for being here today and sharing her journey with us and we just really hope that this podcast helps somebody even if it's just one person I just hope it helps somebody to not feel alone and hear that somebody else has been through 
the yeah. same similar as, as, as them. So. Exactly. I mean, I was gripped the whole way through, even just from an education side of it. I know I mentioned that whenever she was leaving, but mm -hmm. I just picked up so much. And if you mentioned it, you made a really good point. It was something I was thinking the whole way through is how much she knows from before she was born. Right. And again, I think that comes down to the way the family unit is, that they just discuss everything completely openly. Right. And they just, they're just open and talk about it all. And even the horrible, nitty gritty, nasty stuff, it's aired. And I think that's a really, really healthy family network. Absolutely. This is what I was about to say. It was completely healthy. And I think that's probably helped her um, cope with it a lot. Nothing's hidden. She knows it all, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I would absolutely love to one day just say hi to her dad and mum. Like, yeah. even if it's not on here, I would just love to say hi and shake their hands and just hug them if it's allowed. But, yeah. And just say, you've done an amazing job there. Yeah, she's a credit to them. Even just personality-wise, she's just, you know, I, I know when you're 19, you're an adult, you're, you're fully grown, but she just has this level of maturity for being 19 years old and awareness that doesn't come a lot of the time until you're older than that and it probably comes back to her conditions and having gone through what she's gone through she's had to grow up really quickly mm -hmm. and cope with things that most people wouldn't have to cope with maybe until they are adults or maybe never in their lifetime and it's it's also the other part I love it. she's such an open book she wants to share it she wants to raise awareness and she wants to to say it as much as she can and I'm 41 and I struggle with that you know I do my best to but she just oh she's such she's so inspiring yeah but yes her social media her, all her information that she shared will be underneath the video on youtube and on the website um underneath her information so if you'd like to donate to her cause or read a bit more about her or see where her social media is, is and give her a follow then in, you'll find her over there um so for today's spoonful of knowledge and uh, we do like to take from the actual podcast itself. From, so this one's something we've taken from May to today. And this one really actually hit me and stuck with me. Um, because even at my ripe old age of 41, I don't know. I should know this, but I, I, I'd go too far. But so what it was is she said, push yourself. She put, sometimes pushes herself. Um, but you've got to know your limits and therefore if you know your limits you're not going you're not going over and you're not um, affecting yourself too much and um, for me I don't know my limits I don't know if you're the same Haley, but I, I don't know them and I will just go bull or china shop and then I then I break yeah I think that's a really important point because it encompasses both physical and mental health you know you you physically, if you push yourself too far, you're exhausted, you're achy, everything hurts, you may flare up whatever condition it is that you have. And on the flip side, you know, mental health wise, you could just run yourself far too thin, trying to do too much and just end up causing a mental break. And it's just not, it's just not worth it. And it's really hard to figure out what those boundaries are for you because it's different for everybody. Mm -hmm. So push to go for what you want to do but also make sure you're looking after yourself in the process and checking in on yourself absolutely um as you know with me i will push and push and push and i'll crash for days um so i've definitely i'm definitely going to take this from today and Likewise. and i know that Maisie will always sit in my head whenever i'm pushing myself now and going in the back of my head not too far just far enough love it but, but on that note guys um, we really do hope that you enjoyed this podcast and um, we hope that you'll join us for our next one too so yeah so bye from me and bye from me bye bye, bye.